The Legend of Sleepy Hollow by Washington Irving. In the bosom of one of those spacious coves which indent the eastern shore of the Hudson, there is a little valley which is one of the quietest places in the whole world. From the listless repose of the place, and the peculiar character of its inhabitants, the sequester glen has long been known by the name of Sleepy Hollow. A drowsy, dreamy influence seems to hang over the land and to pervade the very atmosphere. Some say that the place was bewitched by a high German doctor during the early days of the settlement. Others, that an old Indian chief held his powwows there. The place still continues under the sway of some witching power that holds a spell over the minds of the good people, causing them to walk in a continual reverie. They are given to all kinds of marvelous beliefs, are subject to trances and visions, and frequently see strange sights, and hear music and voices in the air. The whole neighborhood abounds with local tales, haunted spots, and twilight superstitions. The dominant spirit that haunts this enchanted region is the apparition of a figure on a horseback without a head. It is said by some to be the ghost of a Hessian trooper, whose head had been carried away by a cannonball in some nameless battle during the Revolutionary War, and who is seen by the country folk hurrying along in the gloom of night, as if on the wings of the wind. His body, having been buried in the churchyard, the ghost rides forth to the scene of battle in nightly quest of his head, and in a hurry to get back to the churchyard before daybreak. The specter is known at all the country firesides by the name of the Headless Horseman of Sleepy Hollow. Ichabod Crane tarried in Sleepy Hollow for the purpose of instructing the children in the vicinity. In addition to his other vocation, he was singing master of the neighborhood. One of his sources of fearful pleasure was to pass long winter nights with the old wives as they sat spinning by the fire, with a row of apples roasting and sputtering along the hearth, and to listen to their marvelous tales of ghosts and goblins, and particularly of the headless horseman of the hollow. He would delight them equally with his anecdotes of witchcraft, and of the direful omens and portentous sights and sounds in the air. But if there was a pleasure in all of this, while snugly cuddling by the chimney corner of a chamber that was all a ruddy glow from the crackling fire, and where, of course, no specter dared to show its face, it was dearly purchased by the terrors of his subsequent walk homewards. What fearful shapes and shadows beside his path amidst the dim and ghastly glare of a snowy night? How often did he shriek with a curdling awe at the sound of his own steps on the frosty crust beneath his feet, and dread to look over his shoulders, lest he should behold some uncouth being trampling close behind him? And how often was he thrown into complete dismay by the rushing blast howling through the trees and the idea that it was the galloping Hessian on one of his nightly scourings? All these, however, were mere terrors of the night, phantoms on the mind that walk in darkness, and though he had seen many specters in his time, daily put an end to all of these evils, and he would have passed a pleasant life of it if his path had not been crossed by a being which causes more perplexity to mortal men than ghosts, goblins, and the whole race of witches put together. And that was a woman. Among his musical disciples who assembled to receive his instructions was Katrina Van Tassel, the daughter and only child of a substantial farmer. She was a blooming lass of fresh eighteen, plump as a partridge, ripe and melting and rosy-cheeked as one of her father's peaches, and universally famed, not merely for her beauty, but her vast expectations. Ichabod Crane had a soft and foolish heart towards the sex, and it is not to be wondered at that so tempting a morsel soon found favor in his eyes, more especially after he had visited her paternal mansion. As he rolled his great green eyes over the fat meadow lands, the rich fields of wheat, of rye, of buckwheat and Indian corn, and the orchards burdened with ruddy fruit, which surrounded the warm tenement of Van Tassel, his heart yearned after the damsel who was to inherit these domains. Among the competitors for her, the most formidable was of the name Brom Bones, the hero of the country round, which rang with his feats of strength and hardihood. He was always ready for either a fight were frolic, but had more mischief than ill will in his composition, and with all his overbearing roughness, there was a strong dash of waggish good humor at bottom. This rantable hero had for some time singled out the blooming Katrina for the object of his uncouth gallantries, and though his amorous toyings were something like the gentle caresses and endearments of a bear, yet it was whispered that she did not altogether discourage his hopes. 
Certain it is, his advances were signals for a rival candidate to retire. Such was the formidable rival with whom Ichabod had to contend, and, considering all things, a stouter man than he would have shrunk from the competition, and a wiser man would have despaired. Ichabod made his advances in a quiet and gently insinuating manner. Under cover of his character as singing master, he made frequent visits to the farmhouse. Ichabod became the object of a whimsical persecution to Bones and his gang of rough riders. They smoked up his singing house by stopping up the chimney. They broke into the schoolhouse at night and turned everything topsy-turvy, so that the poor schoolmaster began to think that all the witches in the country held their meetings there. But what was still more annoying, Brom took all opportunities of turning him into ridicule in the presence of his mistress and had a scoundrel dog whom he taught to whine in the most ludicrous manner, and introduced it as a rival to Ichabod's to instruct Katrina in psalmodry. In this way, matters went on for some time, without producing any material effect on the relative situations of the contending powers. On a fine autumnal afternoon, Ichabod received an invitation to attend a merrymaking or quilting frolic at the Van Tassels. He borrowed a horse and issued forth like a knight errant in quest of adventures. The animal he rode was a broken down plow horse that had outlived almost everything but its viciousness. He must have had fire and metal in his day, if we may judge from the name he bore of gunpowder. It was toward evening that Ichabod arrived at the castle of Van Tassel, which he found thronged with the pride and flower of the adjacent country. Brom Bones, however, was the hero of the scene, having come to the gathering on his favorite steed, Daredevil, a creature, like himself, full of metal and mischief, which no one but himself could manage. And now the sound of music from the common room summoned all to the dance. Ichabod prided himself upon his dancing. Not a limb about him was idle, and to have seen his loosely hung frame in full motion and clattering about the room, you would have thought St. Vitus himself, the blessed patron of the dance, was figuring before you in person. The lady of his heart was his partner in the dance, and was smiling graciously in reply to all his amorous oglings. While Brom Bones, sorely smitten with love and jealousy, sat brooding by himself in one corner. When the dance was at an end, Ichabod was attracted to a knot of the satyr folks who sat at one end of the piazza, gossiping over former times, and drawing out long stories about the war. Each storyteller dressed up his tale with a little becoming fiction to make himself the hero of every exploit. But all of these were nothing to the tales of ghosts and apparitions that succeeded. The neighborhood is rich in legendary treasures of the kind. Many dismal tales were told about funeral trains and mourning cries and wailings heard and seen about the great tree where the unfortunate Major Andre was taken. The chief part of these stories, however, turned upon the favorite specter of Sleepy Hollow the headless horseman, who had been heard several times of late patrolling the country, and was said tethered his horse nightly among the graves in the churchyard. The sequestered situation of the church seems to have made it a favorite haunt of troubled spirits. Over a deep black part of the stream, not far from the church, was formerly thrown a wooden bridge. The road that led to it and the bridge itself were thickly shaded by overhanging trees, which cast a gloom about it even in the daytime, but occasioned a fearful darkness at night. Such was one of the favorite haunts of the Headless Horseman, and the place where he was most frequently encountered. The tale was told of Old Brower, how he met the horseman returning from his foray into Sleepy Hollow, and was obliged to get up behind him, how they galloped over bush and brake over hill and swamp until they reached the bridge, when the horseman suddenly turned into a skeleton, threw Old Brower into the brook, and sprang away over the treetops with a clap of thunder. The story was immediately matched by a marvelous adventure of Brom Bones, who made light of the galloping Hessian as an errant jockey. He affirmed that on returning one night from the neighboring village, he had been overtaken by this midnight trooper, that he had offered to raise him for a bowl of punch, and should have won it too, for Daredevil beat the goblin horse all hallow. But just as they came to the church bridge, the Hessian bolted and vanished in a flash of fire. All these tales, told in the drowsy undertone which men talk in the dark, sank deep into the mind of Ichabod. The revel now gradually broke up. 
Ichabod only lingered behind, according to the custom of country lovers, to have a tete-a-tete with the heiress. Something must have gone wrong, for he sallied forth, after no great interval, with an air quite desolate and chapfallen. It was the very witching time of night that Ichabod pursued his travels homewards. All the stories of ghosts and goblins that he had heard in the afternoon now came crowding into his recollection. The night grew darker and darker. He had never felt so lonely and dismal. He was, moreover, approaching the very place where the scenes of these ghost stories had been laid. In the center of the road stood an enormous tree, which towered like a giant above all the other trees in the neighborhood, and formed a kind of landmark. As Ichabod approached this fearful tree, he began to whistle. He thought his whistle was answered. It was but a blast sweeping sharply through the dry branches. Suddenly he heard a groan. His teeth chattered and his knees smote against the saddle. It was but the rubbing of one bough against another as they swayed about by the breeze. He passed the tree in safety, but new perils lay before him. About 200 yards from the tree, a small brook crossed the road and ran into a marshy and thickly wooded glen. A few rough logs laid side by side served as a bridge over the stream. On that side of the road where the brook entered the wood, a group of oaks and chestnuts threw a cavernous gloom over it. To pass this bridge was the severest trial. As he approached the stream, his heart began to thump. He summoned all his resolution, gave his horse half a score kicks in the ribs, and attempted to dash briskly across the bridge. Gunpowder dashed forward, snuffling and snorting, but came to a stand just by the bridge, with a suddenness that had nearly sent its rider sprawling over its head. Just at this moment, a plashy tramp at the side of the bridge caught the sensitive ear of Ichabod. In the dark shadow of the grove, on the margin of the brook, he beheld something huge, misshapen, and towering. It stirred not, but seemed to gather it up in the gloom, like some gigantic monster ready to spring upon the traveler. Just then the shadowy object of alarm put itself in motion. He appeared to be a horseman of large dimensions and mounted on a black horse of powerful frame. He kept aloof on one side of the road, jogging along on the bland side of old gunpowder, who had now got over his fright and waywardness. Ichabod, who had no relish for this strange midnight companion, and bethought himself of the adventure of Rom Bones with the galloping Hessian, now quickened his steed in hopes of leaving him behind. The stranger, however, quickened his horse to an equal pace. Ichabod pulled up and fell into a walk, thinking to lag behind. The other did the same. There was something in the moody and dogged silence of this pernicious companion that was mysterious and appalling. It was soon fearfully accounted for, and mounting a rising ground which brought the figure of his fellow traveler and relief against the sky, gigantic in height and muffled in a cloak, Ichabod was horror-struck on perceiving that it was headless. But his horror was still more increased on observing that the head, which should have rested on his shoulders, was carried before him on the pommel of his saddle. His terror rose to desperation. He reined in a shower of kicks and blows upon gunpowder, hoping by a sudden movement to give his companion the slip. But the specter started full jump with him. Away they dashed through the thick and thin, stones flying and sparks flashing at every bound. Ichabod's flimsy garments fluttered in the air, and he stretched his long, lank body away over the horse's head in the eagerness of his flight. They had now reached the road, which turns off to Sleepy Hollow, but gunpowder, who now seemed possessed with a demon, instead of keeping up it, made an opposite turn and plunged headlong downhill to the left. This road leads through a sandy hollow, shaded by trees, for about a quarter of a mile, where it crosses a bridge famous in goblin story, and just beyond swells the green knoll which stands the whitewashed church. As yet, the panic of the steed had given his unskillful rider an apparent advantage in the chase. But just as he got halfway through the hollow, the girths of the saddle gave way, and he felt it slipping from under him. He seized it by the pommel and endeavored to hold it firm, but in vain. He had just time to save himself by clasping old gunpowder around the neck when the saddle fell to the earth and he heard it trampled underfoot by his pursuer. An opening in the trees now cheered him with the hopes that the church bridge was at hand. He recollected the place where Brom Bones' ghostly competitor had disappeared. 
If I can but reach the bridge, thought Ichabod, I'm safe. Just then he heard the black steed panting and blowing close behind him. He even fancied that he felt the hot breath. Another convulsive kick in the ribs and gold gunpowder sprang upon the bridge. He thundered over the resounding planks. He gained the opposite side, and now Ichabod cast a look behind him to see if the pursuer should vanish, according to the rule in a flash of fire and brimstone. Just then, he saw the goblin rising in his stirrups and in the very act of hurling his head at him. Ichabod endeavored to dodge the horrible missile, but too late. It encountered his cranium with a thunderous crash. He was tumbling headlong into the dust, and Gunpowder, the black steed, and the goblin rider passed by like a whirlwind. The next morning, the old horse was found without a saddle and with a bridle under his feet, soberly chopping the grass at his master's gate. Ichabod did not make his appearance at breakfast. Dinner hour came, but no Ichabod. The boys assembled at the schoolhouse and strolled idly along the banks of the brook, but no schoolmaster. An inquiry was set on foot, and after a diligent investigation, they came upon his traces. In one part of the road leading to the church was found the saddle trampled in the dirt. The tracks of the horse's hooves, deeply dented in the road, and evidently at furious speed, were traced to the bridge, beyond which, on the bank of the broad part of the brook, where the water ran deep and black, was found the hat of the unfortunate Ichabod, and close behind it a shattered pumpkin. The mysterious event caused much speculation at church on the following Sunday. Knots of gazers and gossips were collected in the churchyard, at the bridge, and at the spot where the hat and pumpkin were found. The stories of Brower and Bones and a whole budget of others were called to mind, and when they had diligently considered them all, and compared them to the symptoms of the present case, they shook their heads and came to the conclusion that Ichabod had been carried off by the galloping Hessian. It is true, an old farmer, who had been down to New York on a visit several years after, and from whom the account of this ghostly adventure was received, brought home the intelligence that Ichabod Crane was still alive, that he had left the neighborhood partly through fear of the goblin and partly in mortification at having been suddenly dismissed by the heiress. Brom Bones, too, who shortly after his rival's disappearance conducted the blooming Katrina in triumph to the altar, was observed to look exceedingly knowing whenever the story of Ichabod was related and always burst into a hearty laugh at the mention of the pumpkin, which led some to suspect that he knew more about the matter than he chose to tell. The old country wives, however, who are the best judges of these matters, maintain to this day that Ichabod was spirited away by supernatural means. And it is a favorite story often told in the neighborhood around the winter evening fire. The schoolhouse being deserted soon fell to decay, and was reported to be haunted by the ghost of an unfortunate pedagogue chanting a melancholy tune among the tranquil solitudes of Sleepy Hollow. This has been Lego Sleepy Hollow, adapted from The Legend of Sleepy Hollow by Washington Irving. Adapted by John Herchuk, this is a Checker Joy production, October 2019.